Uh, COVID-19 is, um, is a coronavirus and we have four endemic coronaviruses in the country. So the transmission um, is, is thought to be very similar to other coronaviruses. So that's how we have this, that's where this information comes from. And so most coronaviruses are spread through droplet. So that's actually those larger droplets that spew when you cough or sneeze, talk, sing, I mean, they quickly fall to the ground. Airborne are smaller particles that can linger in the air longer and actually travel through ventilation systems. So most, uh, it's thought that there's, it's spread most commonly by droplet. So not as okay. contagious as something like measles that can be spread airborne. The caveat is, since it is a new virus, um, as an extra level of precaution for healthcare, so in hospitals if someone comes in and they're thought to be infected with coronavirus, that we do ask that that person actually be an airborne, which is a higher level of protection. Um, but that's for healthcare, so what individuals need to know is that it's most likely droplets, so when you're in close contact within three to six feet with someone who is infected. And you talk about other coronaviruses, yes. what do you mean by that? Because I think that's, that was another question that yeah. we had, um, it, that this isn't new, I guess? Right, so yeah, so there's one question about how do we know what, um, you know, if Lysol or these other disinfectants actually kill this virus if it's a new virus and so it's actually um, it's a new type of coronavirus okay. so coronaviruses are viruses that cause most um, colds for the most part so there are four coronaviruses known um, or in endemic so that circulate all of the time and that again most commonly give us symptoms like the uh, like a cold this is a new coronavirus that was just first identified um, in early January you know cases of respiratory illness in China um, you know we started to see this increase in, in um, pneumonia and respiratory infections mm -hmm. in China then they isolated this new so it's a new strain essentially or a new type of coronavirus um, and so that that's all that that we that's all that means is it's a new uh, which is why we call it novel it's mm -hmm. a new coronavirus so not frequent not previously identified um, and then I think the other part of this question was uh, is incubation period can it be longer than 14 days so the range is 2 to 14 days so if you're exposed to someone who's infected and they transmit that virus this virus to you um, how long before you develop symptoms and so the range is 2 to 14 days mm -hmm. so some people as soon as two days after may develop symptoms up to as long as 14 days most people develop symptoms within five days of exposure okay. there are some outliers that might be a little bit longer than 14 days um, maybe Maybe as long as 21, but the great majority is between 2 to 14 days and really most likely are more likely to be about 5 or 6 days after your exposure. All right, so another question that came in is, is there a shot that we can take for COVID-19? There is no vaccine to protect against this virus. Um, there is, you know, there are studies underway, as what we've been told, but those seem to be about a year, a year and a half um, away. So there's no new, there's no vaccine on the horizon. So it's just back to good preventive measures. We want to try to prevent the spread in the community um, until we get things like, uh, you know, recognized treatments for this virus, vaccine. So uh, there is no vaccine, no treatment um, for for COVID-19. All right, and um. We have another question. We've heard that it's more it's uh, that the common flu is more deadly. Is that true? No. So um, the mortality rate. So that's the people who the, the percentage of people who die once mm -hmm. infected for the flu is about 0.1 percent. Studies out of China have shown the number changes two to three, three to four. Uh, is the mortality percent is the mortality rate. So out of every, so if we say two to three percent mortality rate, so out of every hundred people who are infected, uh, two to three percent, uh, two to three will die. So that number may actually be a little lower. So that's what we're hearing from China. But uh, but with the so known mortality rate is still higher with COVID-19. Okay. Uh, it's two to three percent as opposed to 0.1 percent for flu. Now that number might lower, but uh, but at this point, no, this virus um, does have a higher mortality rate than the flu. And this is I mean, like you said, like we know, I think a little more about the flu and we mm -hmm. know how to treat it yes. and we know we have a vaccine yes. for the flu. Right. So we have a vaccine for the flu. We have antivirals that mm -hmm. we know treat the flu. So with this virus, all those things are, um, are in the works. But we right now the best, um, you know, best treatment that we have is, of course, prevention and then right. supportive care. If someone does become sick. All right, and we want to remind everyone, go ahead and submit your questions now. We're live on Facebook, so you can type those questions up. Any questions that you may have. Um, real quick, you were talking about preventative measures. Mm -hmm. Let's go over those again, because yeah, they sure. may seem like common sense things, yes. but, you know, it's always good to kind of remind people. Yeah, and they actually really are common sense um, things. When you look back even, um, you know, centuries ago, soap was, you know, soap, soap has been around a very long time. Right. So there's a reason for that. Um, and actually, when you look historically, when, when um, hygiene practices decreased, mortality rates increased. So just good basic hygiene 
is effective. It works. And so I think a lot of times we think we get caught up in the more sophisticated, you know, uh, methods of preventing illness. Um, this is just a very basic, something very basic. So wash your hands. So that's uh, water, cold or warm, 20 seconds. You lather for 20 seconds. Happy birthday song twice. Then you rinse and dry with a towel. So keep your hands clean. The best way to, to protect ourselves from any infection. So the flu, stomach viruses, COVID-19. Um, stay home if you're sick so that you don't spread whatever it is that you have to other people. If you're older than 60, especially if you're older than 80, it's now being recommended until we know what, um, what the true community uh, transmission is, that you avoid crowded areas, mm -hmm. crowded spaces, um, yeah. because those individuals are more likely, we talked about a mortality rate, the mortality rate is higher in people over older than 60, especially those older than 80 years of age, and then people with underlying health problems like diabetes, liver disease, kidney problems, heart so disease. So you kind of know, you know, what you may have and yes. if you should stay away for a little bit. Right, yeah. exactly. So keep your hands clean. Try not to touch your face with hands that might Which be Which we all know that's hard. Because it's very hard. I'm trying very hard not to do it myself. We've talked about that all morning because, you know, we're all like this or we're yes. touching or your face seems to itch a little bit more yes. when you... Right, when we talk about it, so have tissue, you know, have tissue available yeah. if your nose starts to uh, run, your highest itch, and then throw it away. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, I think it's important we talk about people who are most at risk being older or underlying health problems, so it's important if you're in that group. But also if you live or care for an individual in that group, you want to keep yourself healthy so that you can continue to, uh, to help take care of those individuals um, or even just being in contact with them. Right. You don't want to spread, uh, you don't want to spread an illness to them. But it is important to know that we do not have community transmission in Acadiana. Yeah. Um, our lab uh, will be doing more testing. So as the, um, as the test kits were rolled out from the Centers for Disease Control about a week ago, um, and we've actually been able to secure more tests from the CDC. So as the test um, kits become in better supply, we're, we will now be able to monitor or test um, for surveillance using, um, using a network that we've got across the state to survey for flu. Mm -hmm. So we will now be testing through our state lab, even uh, samples that come in through physicians, through clinics around the state. So we'll have more information about kind of the underlying level of COVID-19 in our community. So in addition to, to people who are sick, um, who will now, who are tested through their, uh, through the hospital or their physician, um, we will also test individuals who um, who might not rise to that level. So I think over the next couple of weeks, we'll learn more about how much COVID-19 we actually have in our community. And you know, like you were saying, we're not um, we're not trying to make people fearful of no. this. It's really just kind of educating and things like that, because right now in Acadiana, we're good. Right, but if you but look nationally, internationally, mm -hmm. you know, there's a reason that, um, you know, China quarantined tens of millions of people. You know, Italy, um, we all see what's happening in Italy right now. There's a reason that these measures are taken. Right. It's because that burden or that level of disease and illness in a community or in a country really, really burdens, in addition to, of yeah. course, mortality, right, burdens the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And so we all need to, to kind of look at the bigger picture. It's definitely, we don't want to alarm anyone, but um, but it, we need to be responsible. And right. this is a new virus. It's it's really wreaking havoc. Um, in Italy, this is the biggest healthcare crisis um, that they've had. So it, it it is wreaking havoc across the world. We need to be smart um, and realize that there are, you know, really well-tested, proven techniques to slow down the spread of these kinds of illnesses. They're basic public health me measures, good hygiene, and then quarantine and um, non-pharmaceutical intervention, social uh, distancing when, when you do see a level of spread in a community. So one other question that we had was, my spouse has blood cancer and mm -hmm. we are staying at a hotel before he goes to his appointment in Houston. How do you clean a hotel room of the nasty germs? And should we handle our own luggage? Any other tips would be appreciated. So um, it's a great question. So if someone did, is immunocompromised, they had cancer, they're more, more, they are more at risk for this virus as they are for many other things. And so I would say, um, you know, look at commonly touched surfaces. And hard surfaces are easier to disinfect than soft surfaces, okay. soft surfaces, of course. So disinfect the frequently touched surfaces. So if you're in a hotel room, bring disinfectant wipes and, t and wipe down those surfaces that you frequently touch. So remotes in the room, door handles in the bathroom, um, door knobs. Um, so that, that's really the best thing that you can do is, is try to disinfect. Um, I would say, again, bring disinfectant wipes, wipe down hard surfaces that are frequently touched. Um, before he's uh, before he touches them, mm -hmm. and I would say to his wife, wear if you have disposable gloves, wear those gloves. I was going to ask about that. Do yeah. the disposable gloves are those a good thing? Yeah. So okay. I would wear those at, when you're wiping everything down. Take them off and then wash your hands. Um, you know that's probably the best thing to do. As far as the luggage, 
Yes, I mean, if you can handle your own luggage, if it's heavy, you don't want anybody to hurt themselves. So if someone else does handle their luggage, again, just wipe off the handles with a disinfecting wipe once you get into the room. Okay, so kind of to go along with that question, um, if I have uh, had surgery in the past, mm -hmm. am I at risk? So um, only if you have heart disease, you know, I'm not sure with, with the uh, surgery, um, you know, with, with that, what type of surgery that was, so it's hard to answer. Mm -hmm. But I would say people who are immunocompromised, people who have heart disease, kidney, liver disease, um, lung problems, those are people who are more at risk. If you're mm -hmm. older, then, then you're more at risk. Okay, so just kind of, you know, have all of those in yeah, your just, mind and... Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is a big question, and I think we've gotten a lot of these. I'm scheduled okay. for a cruise out oh, of yes. New Orleans to the Bahamas in Key West on April 11th through the 18th. Should I cancel it or should I wait? So, um, <laughs> so most people probably saw yesterday, I think the State Department um, issued some recommendations for people to rethink cruises, mm -hmm. especially if, um, if you're someone with an underlying health condition or if you're older. So I think the recommendation is that if you're older than 60, definitely if you're older than 80, if you have underlying medical problems, you might need to th rethink the cruise. So on cruises, people are in close quarters. Yeah. Um, it's very easy for germs to spread. So um, if you're young and healthy, you know, I think there's, there's no reason not to go on the cruise. Um, however, if you're older, if you have other health problems, you may want to rethink it. Um, and hopefully some of these cruise lines will make accommodations and refund because you know that that is expensive to cancel um, to cancel a trip that you already have planned. Right. But in addition to that, people who are older have underlying health conditions really should rethink any crowded environment. So cruise ships, yes, because mm -hmm. you're in close contact with people and you share germs. But even flights, any any crowded condition, you need to rethink that. Um, you know, if you feel like you could be compromised weeks. in somehow exactly. some way, yes. Okay. And young healthy people shouldn't be a concern. But right. again those older individuals are with underlying health problems. Right. Um, so we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but this is another question that's kind of come up a lot. Is this a new virus and why do cans of Lysol say that it kills the coronavirus? So um, it is a new, this COVID-19 is a new virus, but again, there are four other um, coronaviruses that circulate all of the so time. So this is why we call it COVID-19. Exactly, because okay. it's a new or novel virus. It's never been identified before, okay. which is why so many people are infected because there's no immunity. However, we do know from other coronaviruses that do typically circulate and cause things like the common cold, then uh, the, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, does have a list of disinfectants that are known to kill those coronaviruses. So it is thought that there should be no difference. Um, this is actually not a very hardy virus. It should not survive very long on services. Again, we don't exactly know how long, um, could be a few hours, up to a few days, you know, hopefully more um, on the lower end because uh, the type of virus it is, it does not survive very well. And it is also easily killed with these typical disinfectants. Oh, perfect. Yeah, because that was actually the next question was how long does it survive yeah, on so it could on be a couple surfaces. hours, yeah. it could be a few days. Thought to again be um, more like, you know, not quite uh, a few days, so in the lower end, but we don't know yet. So, mm -hmm. which is why we talk about creating a clean environment around you to reduce the level of germs. All right, perfect. Okay, next one. Louisiana's yes. first patient is in New Orleans. I was in New Orleans for Mardi Gras. Am I at risk? Uh, no, you should not be at risk <laughs> from this case as okay. far as we know. So I will say what happens when a case is, when we know, um, when a case is identified, just like many other infectious diseases, what we do in the Office of Public Health, we have epidemiologists who do case investigation. So what happens is that when someone's identified with, with COVID-19, just like if they um, have some of these other reportable diseases, we talk to that person, we find out where they might have been, um, who they might have been in close contact with, so three to six feet and then we notify those individuals okay. uh, to let them know that they might have been exposed. Of course, Mardi Gras, um, how would you possibly know who you were exposed to right. um, you know, in those crowded conditions? But you know, Mardi Gras, um, we're, we're further out now. Most people would develop symptoms within about five days, and there's, there's no known um, cases or exposure that occurred in, uh, in New Orleans Mardi Gras this year. So I would say not to be concerned about um, not to be concerned about that. All right, guys, we want to remind you guys that we are taking questions live on Facebook right now. So get your questions in, anything that you want to know about coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, one other question, does bedding need special attention, especially pillows? So um, no, just again, whatever you do normally at home, to, uh, to clean your environment. So soft, uh, so soft things like sofas and all might be hard to clean um, mm -hmm. and definitely not, you can't disinfect. But uh, sheets, um, pillows, just wash as you normally would and okay. dry and that 
should kill this virus like it would any um, most other viruses. So it needs to be in you, I guess, to just really develop. So, uh, so right again, so if you think about a soft surface, so bedding, you're sleeping on that bedding. So, you right. know, you do want to keep your bedding clean because again, that's how you prevent spread of lots mm -hmm. of infections. But if you're on a surface, if you're sitting on a sofa somewhere, for example, you know, it would only be if you're, you know, rubbing that surface and then touching your, your okay. eyes, nose, okay. and mouth, and then there's a potential for spread. Mm -hmm. um, or a child that's, you know, uh, putting their face on surfaces that could be dirty, which we you know, know children do, do that yep. all the time. <laughs> but um, again, the most common mode of transmission is not thought to be this indirect uh, spread from objects. It really is thought to be person to person when you're in close contact with someone. But it is, we do, um, there is that theoretical risk mm -hmm. for environmental transmission. And so we do want people to keep the environment around them as clean as possible. All right. Is the coronavirus deadly if you have an immune system disease or any other health disease dealing with organs? So, um, so the mortality rate, as we know from China, is about two to three percent. So yes, there are, um, you know, we've seen thousands of people internationally who have died. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, the coronavirus or COVID-19 does have, um, can be deadly for individuals who are at higher risk for infection. Immunocompromised definitely would be someone who needs to be concerned. Uh, again, just know that you can, you know, how to limit your risk um, from being infected avoid crowded situations, especially if the virus is circulating in, in a community. So we see around the country of New York has, uh, has a, a spike in cases, uh, Seattle, mm -hmm. California. So just monitor daily. Those numbers are going to change. And as because we, we kind of see that, we can see where yes. those, those numbers are. We'll see are. little hotspots yeah. popping up around the country. And as testing increases in the United States, mm -hmm. which it, it will be now because through our state public health lab, we'll be increasing testing. And then private labs or commercial labs now have the availability to test. Right. So we're going to see more positive. So just monitor that. Mm -hmm. And then again, try to limit crowded situations if you're someone who is more at risk. And I know in these crowded situations, a lot of times people want to wear the masks. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, because sure. there's different kind of masks, but it doesn't always help. Right. Yeah. So masks are not recommended for the general public. The mask, so uh, first there's a surgical mask, which is just a flat mask okay. that you see lots of people wear. Those masks are actually for the sick person to wear to keep the droplets from being spewed and from the sick person being able to transmit to other people. So if you go into the emergency room or at a walk-in clinic or your doctor's office and you have a cough, they may ask you to put one of those masks on. That's to protect everybody else around you. If you're in healthcare, we wear, um, you see those, they're called an N95 mask. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a more of a coned or round shaped mask. Those are for healthcare workers. And healthcare workers are actually fit tested. So we, uh, we wear, we, um, we have to be sure that those actually fit, that they protect, that they're sealed. There's, you know, you have to know how to wear the mask, how to put it on properly, and, and you need to be fit tested so we can be sure that the mask actually fits you. And you're not constantly touching your face exactly. trying to fix the mask, right? right? And right? so that's the other thing is when people who uh, wear masks aren't used to wearing them, mm -hmm. um, they actually are more inclined to touch that mask, keep readjusting it, and so there you go with um, exposing your, you know, your face to hands that might be uh, dirty. So you're touching the mask and you're touching your eyes, you're readjusting it. So masks are not, at this point, are not recommended for the general public. Okay. We also want to save those masks for health care. So we want to be sure that we have the availability for people who need to wear the masks to protect themselves, which are health care workers. Right. Because they're the, going to be the ones most exposed to this. You know? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, is the coronavirus instant death? How likely is someone to recover from it? Okay. So, um, no, it's not uh, the, not instant death. Most people who have coronavirus, um, who are infected with this virus, 80% of people would develop pretty mild illness. Um, again, the mortality rate is thought to be about two to three percent. Mm -hmm. It might actually be lo be lower. We don't know. As um, as we see more cases here in the United States, we'll have a better idea. Um, as we continue to monitor what's happening across the country, we'll have a better idea. However, some people who um, some people who are who do develop more severe illness, it may take them several weeks to recover, as long as six weeks. So it is um, it, it it is mild in most people, but for those people who do develop more severe infection. There is a mortality rate again, um, so some people do die, unfortunately, and we've seen that uh, again around the country. Right. Um, you know, close to 30 deaths in the United States at this point. I'm sure, unfortunately, we hope that number won't go up, but it probably will. So, not instant death, but it, it can be very dead. It can be deadly. To it those needs people. to be taken care of. For yes, sure. yes, needs to be taken care of and taken seriously. Yeah.
All right, so should I, this is another question that mm -hmm. we um, got through Facebook, should I limit my contact with a friend who recently took a domestic flight to ensure that he isn't sick? We are 68 and 75 and both have health issues. So no, I know of no known um, exposure that has occurred on domestic flights. Mm -hmm. So I would say the answer to that is, um, is no. However, if you are, you know, 65, um, and uh, or 68 68 and 75, 75. you probably should rethink traveling. Okay. Um, traveling or fly, uh, let me take that back. You should probably rethink flying anywhere mm -hmm. yourself. Um, now, if your friend who traveled, as long as they're not sick, you know, if they did, if they did develop symptoms, then yes, you should limit your exposure to those individuals, of course, if they're sick. Okay. But, um, and that individual should, um, again, should be fine unless they traveled to a part of the country where there's um, lots of infection. So that's another thing to consider. Was your friend recently in one of these uh, communities in the United States where we're seeing more community mm -hmm. transmission? Um, if so, you know, make sure they're not symptomatic. Um, themselves, of course. Yeah. And there's a website too they can go to, right, if they yes. want to take a look at the map to see. Right, yeah. yeah, so the Johns Hopkins map that y'all been showing is great. Mm -hmm. it, it shows real time where we're seeing cases around the country and the world. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, another question that came through Facebook, can I take common cold flu medications to prevent getting the virus? So, um, to prevent a virus, it's to those good hygiene tips, mm -hmm. um, and a vaccine hopefully eventually will be, um, you know, will be developed. And, but that's about a year, year and a half away. So those cold and flu medications are just symptomatic treatment. So if you do have a cough, a mild cough, you can take those medications and it may help to relieve the symptoms. It's not gonna kill this virus. Mm -hmm. um, there is no, uh, no treatment at this point, although there are therapeutics being tested and so hopefully you know, over the, the coming months there will be treatment. All right, perfect. Okay, so um, another question. If it's like the flu, should it be gone when summer approaches? Now, is it like the flu or so it's it's a little different than the flu um, and the answer to the summer is we don't know uh, so we do see a decrease for example with the flu another respiratory illness so it is similar to the flu in that it's a respiratory illness right um, but we don't know if it's gonna uh, if we'll see levels decrease in the summertime time will tell so we do hope that we do we see that but we just don't know yet correct okay um, why COVID-19 why didn't they pick another number so uh, COVID-19 stands for coronavirus mm -hmm. disease um, and 19 is a year. 2019 is when the first cases were, um, were identified in China. That makes sense. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and how many actual cases are children? We're hearing nothing about children um, at all getting it. So there's still, uh, you know, all this information, you know, uh, there's still studies out there mm -hmm. trying to identify who's actually, um, you know, infected by age group across the world. But right now it does look like children uh, are somewhat protected. Okay. Um, very few numbers in children, um, but there are no hard and fast numbers as of yet. All right, which is good to know because I know we've had some questions on whether I send my child to daycare or how yes. do I protect my child. So. Right, and so contrast this to H1N1 in 2009, mm -hmm. the high risk group was children. We saw lots of transmission in children. It was very obvious um, from the beginning and that's, uh, that's why we, we saw great measures taken to try to reduce the spread in children. With this virus, again, just for this, these first few months, what we know is that children do not seem to be as susceptible as, uh, as older individuals. Okay, so I'm just gonna, I know this has a mm -hmm. few parts to it, so let's just yeah. start with the first okay. part. Um, a question from Facebook, why is all of Italy now under quarantine if this virus is so mild? That's so, the first part of the question. So it's mild in 80% of people, younger individuals, but not so in older individuals with okay. those with underlying health problems. So it is a concern. Um, it can be crippling to the healthcare industry. So we, it's a new virus. We don't have known, uh, a proven treatment yet, no vaccine. So the goal is to try to mitigate or control the spread mm -hmm. until we can, again, get, you know, ha get some of the answers that we, um, to the questions that we don't know or, again, proven treatment. So we want to try to prevent the further spread in a community. And on top of that, Italy has a, um, as an aging population. So they have lots of older individuals in Italy. So, um, so that's why, you know, Italy has made these decisions to quarantine to, uh, to again try to limit uh, the spread by trying to control interactions of people, these non-pharmaceutical interventions they're called. And it was actually very effective in China. Mm -hmm. They established very strict quarantine. Tens of millions of people 
were quarantined and we see a decrease in cases circulating in that country. So Italy, okay. you know, clearly is hoping to see that same, that same benefit through these quarantine measures. So how many cases do, this is the second part of the question, how many cases do we really have considering we waited several weeks to start testing? So we don't know. No, no. That's, that's a great question. We don't know how long this virus has been circulating in communities. For example, in Washington State, based on DNA testing, they, they um, it looks like this virus has actually been circulating there for a few weeks uh, prior, even a few weeks prior to testing starting. Um, so we don't know, and that's what we'll learn, I think, over the next couple of weeks, is how much, what is the burden of this virus in our communities as we do ramp up testing. All right, so um, someone else wrote in that I have a child with asthma. Is he more at risk? So right now, again, there's no, uh, children are not in the high risk group, mm -hmm. but people with lung uh, or pulmonary issues are. So I would say, even though there's no proven, um, you know, children and children with asthma aren't in any established um, or published high risk group, I would say that uh, the parents should act as though that child were and just be cautious and again, monitor what's happening in the community. All right, and I wanna go back to some questions that we had um, a little bit earlier this mm -hmm. morning on GMA. One was about the strain of COVID-19, mm -hmm. if there were two different types, and, and someone had that question a little bit earlier. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the scientific literature coming out of China over the last couple of days um, has indicated that it looks like maybe two variants to this virus. Mm -hmm. um, one that was circulating earlier and then maybe a newer variant but um, does not look like it's made any great mutation. You know, a lot of concern about that. Um, that I think actually the scientific community doesn't really know what this means, that there are right. these two variants. And so still a lot to be known about yeah. what's circulating. So I feel like we still have, you know, a lot of questions that yes. need to be answered, um, but you know, you guys are doing that. Uh, and you know, guys, we wanted to thank you guys for joining us here on GMA after the show. And thank Dr. Tina Stavansky yes. for being here all morning long um, and answering your questions. Um, if we didn't get to your question, we will try to get some of those answered. Um, this will also be posted on KDC.com a little bit later on. Again, Dr. Stavansky, thank, thank you, you so much for being here. Yeah, we appreciate thanks for it. the opportunity to answer questions. I appreciate it. All right, you guys have a great day.